is the is the leading representative of this. Uh, that's uh, that's unfortunate. Now here's here's the thing, right? Godless is uh, the notion that's operative here. The wedge document there talks about the um, the theistic consequences uh, that have undermined this, right? And we have to replace it with something that supposedly is. Uh, consonant with a theistic understanding. And here's where I wanted to step back and, and do a little bit about the theological view. Is it really the case that evolution is godless? Because this is portrayed as the science versus religion, Darwin versus God. And, and here's where I want to, uh, to make us think a little bit about that and question whether that's so. Even though that's put forward in the stereotypical media reports, and it's certainly the way the creationists want it to be pr promoted, uh, let's take a look and see if that's really true. So is evolution necessarily godless? Well, not necessarily. Here's a, here's a little cartoon that uh, kind of gives an alternative view. It's God having uh, created the world, uh, resting a little bit and says, I'm tired of making decisions. Let's just go with natural selection. Uh, now, that's kind of a, uh, an amusing, funny way to put this, but in fact, that's a dominant theological position. Uh, that's a view that says God creates the world with its natural laws in place uh, that give rise to all of the complexities of the world. And it's not the case that, dark, that God has to go in and constantly fiddle with things. He creates it in such a way that the laws, including the evolutionary laws, uh, are in place to produce creation as, as intended. And this is a, a, a mainstream theological position. Uh, it's a position uh, that was put forward uh, in the Catholic Church. So um, the previous pope, John Paul II, uh, had an encyclical um, letter to the uh, Pontifical Academy of Science where he talks about evolutionary theory as it's more than a hypothesis, well supported by evidence, and not in contradiction to Catholic faith. Uh, that actually made big news, but it, it shouldn't have been news because this was old, uh, an old position within the Catholic Church. Uh, pope Pius XII, back in the 1950s, had said, uh, very much the same thing, that evolution is not in contradiction with faith. Now, it's not usually from the Catholic side that you get opposition to evolution. Usually it's been from the Protestant side. And so here I'm going to mention someone um, on, um, on that side. And, and there are lots of people that I could pull from, but I, I mentioned Benjamin Warfield here, who was a theologian at Princeton Theological Seminary. And here's what he wrote. Uh, he says, I don't think there's any general statement in the Bible any part of the account of creation in Genesis 1 or 2 or anywhere alluded to that need be opposed by evolution. Now, why is Warfield important? Warfield was the theologian who was uh, responsible for getting together the series of pamphlets called the Fundamentals. Okay? And it was out of that, those series of pamphlets that much of the fundamentalist movement got started. So this is an interesting way in which sort of current fundamentalists who oppose evolution have forgotten really their, their roots in history. Um, those people didn't see that there was a necessary contradiction here. Uh, the, the way that I put it in, in Tower of Babel was that evolution is godless, sure, but it's godless in the same way that plumbing is godless. Okay? Uh, as scientists, uh, we go about our business, uh, as plumbers go about their business, and you don't, as part of that process, uh, uh, appeal to the divine, appeal to miracles. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you're an atheist. It doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're godless. That's a different kind of question. Now, this is not... Uh, uh, an unusual view. This is a mainstream view. So let me just give you a couple more examples. It's called theistic evolution, generally. There are other, other names. But uh, here's a statement from the Presbyterian Church. There's no contradiction between an evolutionary theory of human origins and the doctrine of God as creator. Lots of mainstream uh, Protestant um, denominations have these sorts of statements, saying that there is no contradiction. That's a dominant, theistic evolution is a dominant uh, Christian view. And this is the thing that, that never really gets ac across because the way in which the creationists want to put this forward is, is though they're representing the Christian view, whereas in fact they're rejecting the mainstream Christian view. They're a, they're a much narrower um, uh, sectarian view. Uh, and just to, to hammer this point home, here's a quote from uh, William Dembski uh, explicitly rejecting that mainstream view. Design theorists, he says, are no friends of theistic evolution. So they're rejecting the mainstream Christian view. This is an important thing to recognize um, that the way typically this puts forward as though they're representing Christianity um, uh, is not so. And this is what came across uh, to the judge as well. This is a narrow um, special interest uh, form of religion. 
lots of examples that one could give. Uh, and, and here's some to just uh, show this in a slightly different light. Here's an interview at a uh, Christian book, which is an evangelical um, book, and it is asking someone, you know, what's been the response of the Christian community to your work? And who's being interviewed here? Uh, this is Philip Johnson again, the leader of the intelligent design movement. He says, I'm extremely controversial or even dismissed out of hand in the Christian academic community in the moderate to liberal mainstream denominations. Okay? Dismissed out of hand. Okay? This is not the dominant view. How about this? Here's Dembski speaking in 1995. He says, it's ironic that the design theorists have received an even cooler reception from the theological community than from the Darwinist establishment which not surprisingly isn't well disposed towards the design theorists either, uh, which of course is true. Science has never taken this seriously. But it's not recognized that the theological community has also been uh, equally unhappily, unhappy with them. Have things gotten better for them? No, they haven't. Here's Dembski now speaking in 2005, noting a statement from uh, the president of the Institute for Religion in the Age of Science. So this is a pro-religion um, group. And he says, Michael Cavanaugh has now issued a formal warning about intelligent design, the wedge, and Seattle's Discovery Institute, urging that people take seriously the threat to education and democracy that these pose. And what was it that Kavanaugh uh, said, describing ID? He said, this is totalitarian religious thought. Right? Uh, this is not uh, the kind of, of uh, religious Christian view uh, that we really want to, to hold. Here's one more, uh, a recent one from... Uh, Robert John Russell, who's the founder of a, another similar group. And he said, intelligent design offers an apparent apologetic hope to believe in Christian, Christians when there's none to deliver. It makes Christianity seem foolish to agnostic scientists who might otherwise have listened to us. It promises only eventual disappointment to Christians who believe in it. The lesson to Christians, he says, is that we should abandon ID as fool's gold. Okay? This is not something that one generally hears about this, but this is very common. Uh, what about the evangelicals go? Okay, those are the mainstream to liberal ones. Well, how about this? Here's Johnson again, and he says the most peculiar reaction I get is the hostility I encounter from many professors at Christian colleges and seminaries. You'd be amazed, he said, if I gave you a list of the evangelical institutions that don't want me on campus. Okay, so even from that side, there's getting opposition. Here's one more. Francis Collins, right, head of the Human Genome Project now, uh, a biologist, scientist, and also a professed evangelical Christian. So he was asked about uh, intelligent design uh, on um, an inter interview on the Tucker Carl Carlson show. Uh, this was, this was uh, just, uh, uh, I think, last year. And, and he said that he, he thought it was bad in not just a scientific way, uh, but from his own theological position as well. He says, I'm not an advocate of intelligent design. I think it sets up a God of the gaps kind of scenario. So what's he talking about here? This is not his own view. This is actually a very standard theological objection to a type of argument. And, he, and here's the way he puts it. Well, you know, we haven't yet explained this particular feature of evolution, so God must have done that. And that's really the strategy that you see again and again and again through all creationist writings. They point to something that they say, here's a problem with evolution, here's a gap, here's something they can't explain, and the idea is, God did that. Okay? That's to say you find God or you say, think that you've proven God in the gaps in our understanding and the things that we can't yet explain. It's called the God of the gaps argument because you're, you're finding God in the things that we don't yet know in, in our ignorance. And, and Collins is then articulating the theological objection to this. He says if science ultimately proves that these gaps aren't gaps after all, which is to say science progressively explains more and more about the world, um, then where's God? Okay. God gets crushed out. Uh, as those gaps get closed. And he says, we really ought not to ask people to do that. So here he's giving really what's a standard theological objection to a standard argument, which is the basic uh, intelligent design view. And just one final more, here's a whole book <laughs> from a group of evangelical scientists uh, called Perspectives on an Evolving Creation, which is arguing for uh, evolution uh, and doing this from what they say is a, uh, is a clear um, uh, evangelical perspective. So that's a part of the story that I want to try to uh, emphasize. It's the reason I spent so much time on this, because you never hear 